So where are we? What I'm going to do next is, as I have indicated there, start checking the specific cases. Well, the, the, the very trivial specific case is the case corresponding to particle at rest. So let me consider the Dirac particle at rest. So it is, we are aiming for that limit. So what is the Hamiltonian now, the HD? It was, remember, IH bar C alpha del plus MC squared beta. When you go to the rest case, let me see what notation I'm using for that. It is that. Let's put an R meaning rest. So this one will obviously for two reasons. Either you can immediately think of the following, that this operator is the momentum operator. Therefore, when you are considering a particle at rest, it is the eigenfunction of the moment, eigenspinor rather, eigenspinor of the momentum with the momentum eigenvalue zero. Therefore, you can drop this term automatically or another argument, which is equivalent, of course. You can say that instead of identifying the del D as P, D acting on the psi, if psi is at rest, X is not changing. If the X is not changing, then the action of the gradient operator on the psi doesn't yield anything, it's zero again. Therefore, in both ways, whichever you use, it's up to you. This term is gone, it's dropped. If I have to move it a little down, yes. mc squared beta is the uh, Hamiltonian at rest. Okay. Now, in order to have a systematic approach to the solution, I have to borrow something from the future. What I have to borrow of something from the future is the spin operator. Spin operator. Sigma i. As I have mentioned already in the previous R, this is the generator of the rotations in the spin or space, obviously then uh, it is the spin operator, right? If it is the, because if there is no orbital motion, there is no ordinary motion, then if there is any, any generator of the rotations, it must be due to the intrinsic angular momentum, which is the spin itself. Spin is the intrinsic angular momentum in the absence of no, any orbital motion. What survives is called the spin. Okay. You'll see the reason why I am using this operator, and we have constructed this explicitly. We have seen that it is sigma i, sigma i. I have defined it to be so. It's not a construction, I have defined it. I am sorry if I said construction, it's not correct. We, because we haven't come to that point yet. We are still, we are still uh, borrowing it from a future next week's discussion. Let me notice one thing. This operator with that a particular physical meaning commutes with this Hamiltonian at rest. Well, let me suppress the D. When I'm talking about Hamilton, it's always a Dirac Hamiltonian. Let's not complicate the, not Let's not complicate the notation. So I will suppress whenever I have no need for that. I will suppress the first D. But R is important because it corresponds to the rest. Rest and sigma I commutes. Is it obvious? It is more or less obvious. Why? Because this is a diagonal matrix. 1 and minus 1 sitting in the diagonal blocks. 
This is a diagonal matrix, sigma i, sigma i is sitting at the diagonal block. Obviously, it's a trivial half a minute exercise to demonstrate that they commute because identities commute with any matrix and it is in the block diagonals we have the identities. Why did I need that? Instead of going to this final solution and introduce the spin operator at that level, it's much better systematically to think in, in, at the beginning. When you have these two operators commuting, then they will have simultaneous eigenfunctions, right? Common eigenfunctions. That is, out of the eigenfunctions of the rest Hamiltonian, I can select a subset so that they turn out to be the eigenfunctions of the sigma operator. That's the point. Okay, now let me then uh, work a little bit on the eigenfunctions of the sigma i operator. Let me consider the square of this operator. Any, not all i, any i, i fixed. Sigma 1, sigma 2, or sigma 3, I am considering. Because when you take the square, it means there is a summation over i. Repeated indices are summed over. The general rule is repeated indices are summed over. V indicate the only in the exceptional case of no sum. This is meaning no sum, it's any i. It is sigma 1 squared, or sigma 2 squared, or sigma 3 squared, I am considering. So what is that? It is the square of this operator, right? You multiply it with itself for any i, not sum. Sigma 1 squared Pauli is 1. Sigma 2 squared Pauli is 1. Sigma 3 squared Pauli is 1. Therefore, all these diagonal elements are 1. So this is two-dimensional identity, two-dimensional identity. So altogether, four-dimensional identity. So for capital sigma squared for any i is the identity. So let me define the eigenvalue problem for this operator. Eigenvalue problem. Sigma i, any i, psi i, lambda i, psi i, for instance. If I multiply this, for a given fixed i, with sigma i again, the left hand side is sigma i squared psi i, lambda i times sigma i psi i again, which gives you lambda i squared. That is the identity, therefore lambda i squared becomes 1, lambda r plus minus 1. So the sigma operator, as defined in here, have the eigenvalues plus and minus one all the time. Okay. So what I have to do next now is to consider the energy eigenfunction. Or perhaps, do I pursue? Yeah. Let me pursue. Before moving, turning my attention to the energy, let me pursue the discussion with the spin, 4x4 spin operator a little bit. Choose, consider, sigma 3 specifically. Okay. So let me consider the eigenfunctions. Now I know that the eigenvalues will be plus and minus 1. So sigma 3, psi plus minus. Instead of writing 3 that is associated with the third, as I am focusing on the sigma 3, I suppress that particular index. It is the eigenfunction of the sigma 3 with plus and minus eigenvalue. That's, these are the things which I am interested in. Okay, these are obviously sigma is a four dimension, four by four operator, therefore 
the psi will be a four-dimensional spinor, the eigenfunction of the sigma three. Let me give it, in, in a, give it a name, a notation, introduce a notation, phi and chi. Let me denote this phi plus minus and chi plus minus. These are two two-dimensional spinors now, just to simplify, because sigma has block diagonal form, two by two block diagonal form, therefore I could think of these two-dimensional spinors. So what do I have then? What is the form of this equation? Well, this matrix, sigma three, sigma three, one minus one, one minus one. So it is this interesting matrix. So this equation reads then, sigma three phi plus minus, sigma three chi plus minus, that notation is allowed because phi and chi are two dimensional spinors and capital, the Pauli sigmas are two by two, therefore when you multiply them with two by two matrices, you still get two, two dimensional spinors. Therefore notationally everything's consistent. Is equal to plus minus phi plus minus chi plus minus. So what do I get? I get indeed a similar structures, that is sigma three, phi plus minus is equal to plus minus phi plus minus, sigma three, chi plus minus is equal to plus chi plus minus. Okay. What are the solutions that I get from there? Let me solve this one first and I will solve the other one next. Oh, do I have to go through all that? Okay. <coughs> okay, unfortunately, <laughs> I have to go through that trivial exercise. What is it? What I have is the following. If I move this to the left, what do I have is the following. Sigma 3 minus plus the two-dimensional identity on phi plus minus is equal to zero. Notice that plus minus was in the same order as plus minus in here. When I move this to the left, so the sign in the front of plus minus is minus and plus, okay. So what is this matrix? There are two matrices I have. The upper one is, the upper one is, here this is one minus one minus plus one one. Therefore it is, there are two values, two, two possible values. One is zero, minus two, the other one is two two zero zero zero. The matrix the, this combina this matrix is it has the, those two forms. Obviously when you act that particular matrix to the side plus it kills the lower component. And when this matrix acts on the lower side, it kills the upper component. So up to normalization, the solution which follows from what here is one zero, and this one is zero one, as before. This is two dimensional spin or game, really, no big deal. Up to normalization, I normalize it. So therefore, the possible eigenvalues are one zero zero one. The same follows for the chi. So I can write the results now. Phi plus is one zero, phi minus is zero one, chi plus is one zero, chi minus is zero one. So altogether, 
what is now the the full full psi plus I put them together. Do they, are they really, do they have the proper, the, the correct, can I check that these are really the correct eigenfunctions? For example, what is the action of sigma 3 on this? That hits zero, this hits zero, that is one, zero, one, zero. Indeed, with the plus one eigenvalue. If I now check sigma three on psi minus, one minus one, one minus one, if you want, again, think of the block, zero, one, zero, one, gives you minus, because it, is, it becomes zero minus one, zero minus one, you take the minus out, 0, 1, 0, 1. Indeed, it checks that these are the correct eigenfunctions of the sigma 3 with the associated properties. Now, let me turn my attention this is a bit lengthy, but we have to go through this. Instead of cooking up the result and verifying that the listed uh, eigenfunctions are the correct eigenfunctions of the Hamiltonian at rest, I will construct. That's what I'm doing, I'm constructing. Okay. Now, HR psi rest is E rest, psi rest, right? That's what I'm looking for now. Eigen functions of the rest Hamiltonian. like this. This is rather lengthy. Huh? But anyway, I will do that. It's lengthy, but I have to do it. Let me follow the same routine. It's a bit lengthy, but this is systematic. Sometimes, although I may get bored, it is the safest way of doing it. Let's check whether we, can, we can follow the same pathways. For instance, what is the HR squared? HR squared is MC squared beta squared, right? Because HR is this Hamiltonian. So it is M squared C to the 4 beta squared Beta squared is the identity matrix, right? So it's a constant times the identity matrix. Okay. Let's give this a name. It is, MC squared is, let me call it epsilon, so it is epsilon squared. I don't want to, to carry this over. M C squared I call epsilon. It's the rest mass energy, right? So how do I I implement that relationship on here? I act on it by HR once more. 
So left hand side is H R squared on psi rest. Right hand side is E R times H R acting once more, giving back E R squared. E R squared psi rest. This one is epsilon squared times identity. So what you get is E R squared is epsilon squared, ER is plus minus epsilon, which is mc squared, right? On the natural. So that's an existence of negative energy even for the solution at rest. Amazing, isn't it? So I have now these two sets of eigenfunction in hand. One set is the eigenfunction, eigenspinors, really, we are talking about spinors, of the sigma 3 operator. The other are the eigenfunctions of the HR. And HR are associated with these eigenvalues. Okay. Perhaps I can work out the form of those. This ones. Okay. HR now, these are the energy eigen functions. Let me use a different notation perhaps. Plus minus is equal to plus minus epsilon phi plus minus. Epsilon is, remember, mc squared. That's the definition of the epsilon. Okay, so this is epsilon times the beta. The Hamiltonian itself is epsilon times beta. Epsilons cancel, and so you, you have directly beta phi plus minus equal to plus minus phi plus minus. Oh, this phi is the bad. Uh, Perhaps this type of phi is much better because there previously I used the little phi for the upper component, two spinner, and etc. So let's use this notation so that we don't get confused in notation. Okay. So how do I determine those phi plus phi minus? Now straight phi plus and straight phi minus. And beta, you know the form of the beta. So I minus I phi 1 plus minus phi 2 plus minus plus minus phi 1 plus minus phi 2 plus minus. Capital phi I write as phi 1 and phi 2 in terms of the two components, spinners. So you have then phi 1 plus minus is equal to phi 1 plus minus, whereas, okay, perhaps much better is to write it in the following manner, phi 1 plus minus minus phi 2 plus minus is equal to plus minus phi 1 plus minus minus <coughs> phi 2 plus minus. Okay. No, plus minus again, sorry. There's no question about that. If you get the a plus sign, for the plus sign, you, you see that lower component cancels. Minus equal to uh, plus itself. So, phi 2 plus is 0. Whereas if you get the minus sign, phi 1 minus gets 0 from that equation. You solve them simult simultaneously. Therefore, the full phi 1 
plus is phi 2 plus uh, phi 2 is phi 1 plus 0 phi minus is 0 phi 2 minus so upper two component is associated with, with the plus energy and lower two components are associated with the minus energy it's only natural let me elaborate a little, little bit. We have relativistic spinors four-dimensional. We have non-relativistic spinors two-dimensional. We are both. We are still in the three space dimensions. In the non-relativistic regime, you have two component spinors. In the relativistic regime, you have four component spinors. So this additional two components must be brought in from relativity extreme relativistic limit. If you go to the extreme non-relativistic limit, obviously you have to get rid of that. Negative energy was purely relativistic and when I go to the non-relativistic limit, negative energy part decouples. You see, it doesn't have any ne negative energy, no lower components. Lower components are associated with the negative energy. So indeed, this four-dimensional spinor becomes two-dimensional spinor in the extreme non-relativistic limit, which is at rest. Right. So what we have to do next is, out of this two-dimensional spinors up and two-dimensional spinors down, if we require that they should have, as they commute with the sigma 3, we have demonstrated the commutator, that these should also be simultaneous eigenspinners of the sigma 3, what do I do? I do the following. Let me write the... By the way, there's two sets, both the eigenfunctions of the rest Hamiltonian and eigenfunctions of the sigma 3, being eigenfunctions, I suppress the term in all the spinor, it is whether it's single function or four function, doesn't matter. Being the eigenfunctions of a Hermitian operator, they, are, they have the following property. They are orthogonal to each other if they correspond to two different eigenvalues and they form a complete set. So both sets are complete. There is both spin up and spin down ones are complete and energy plus energy and minus ones are complete. So I can express the energy, each one of the energy eigenfunctions in terms of the eigenspinors of the sigma 3 or vice versa. Because they are both sets are eigenfunctions of Hermitian operators. So if I do that, take the plus one and write it as a superposition of the eigenfunctions of the sigma 3. Each can be expanded in terms of the eigenspinors of sigma 3. Let me do for the phi plus first, the capital phi. Capital phi are the eigenfunctions of the rest Hamiltonian, right? So phi plus is C1. The notation there was psi plus psi minus. And I can use the coefficients plus and plus. And phi minus as C1 minus psi plus minus. Obviously I need two different set of coefficients and if they are normalized of course the coefficient there is one set of relations among the C coefficients that their mod square should add up to one. What is this in the first place? Let me write the right hand side in the first place. Okay. 
You see, the, the, the complication is the notational complication. Instead of scalars, we are dealing with four-dimensional spinners. Simple, but still you see how involved they can become. This one is C1 minus 1010 zero one zero plus C2 minus 0101. Zero one zero one. Again, it becomes something like this C1 minus C2 minus C1 minus C2 minus. Now you require, indeed, again, that these are the eigenfunctions of the beta with the plus, and the other one is with the minus. Then you get the following for that is now. I, I list the possible values. Those, fin please finish this. Require, you have two different sets. Let me summarize. Associate with the Hamiltonian at rest, sigma 3. And they have their own eigenfunctions. And then you require them, uh, out of these two different sets, you try to construct a common set, which are eigenfunctions of both. Take one of them and decompose in terms of the other and require that it also uh, eigenfunctions of the other one. So you get the following so solutions. Psi 1. Positive energy, one, zero, zero. Psi two, positive energy, zero, one, zero, zero. Psi three, negative energy, zero, zero, one, zero. Psi three, four, negative energy, zero, 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 one. This is the positive energy and spin up. This is the positive energy and spin down. That's the negative energy and spin up. Negative energy and spin down, all at rest. So altogether we had four. So you have two labels. You needed two labels because you had two commuting operators. Positive energy, negative energy, and spin up, spin down, all together it adds up to four. Although originally when you look at the Hamiltonian and alone, you have two positive energy, negative energy. You look at the spin, spin up, spin down, but when you put together, you have the four. Four is a crucial number. Otherwise, you would have missed that fourness of the thing. So that's the rest solutions. If these are easy to remember, Easy to remember, uh, although the intermediate steps, I, I realize that I have, for the sake of systematics, I have presented a lengthier version of solution, but try to get used to this, because there's a systematics behind it. If I just go through and try to get the solution in two lines, I can. It is not really a construction, it's a verification. You write the solutions and verify that they are indeed associated with the rest, Positive energy, rest, negative energy, and you impose spin up and spin down, you get those. It's a cheap way of doing it. The correct way of doing this is a bit boring. You finish the computation as I have described. Okay. There are a few lines which I have left as a private homework. The next issue, our mandate is still there. We are going to find the connection, non-relative connection and classical connection but in order to complicate the picture a little bit and enrich it a, bit, a little bit with physics, 
let me introduce let me describe how we introduce the electromagnetism well let me remind you again what was the Dirac Hamiltonian for free particle. Now, in order to emphasize that we are talking about free particle, I will put this additional label. What was it? C alpha P plus MC squared beta. You may say, what P? Well, P is minus IH bar del, right? In the space of functions of X, we know that momentum is always the usual momentum, minus IH bar times del. When you put this back, R minus IH bar C alpha times del is the one which we have originally constructed. So it is more compact that way. How do we introduce the electromagnetism? Well, first of all, how do you describe the electromagnetism? Electromagnetism we will describe with these potentials phi and A. Four potentials. You know that. That was the case in non-relativistic quantum mechanics. When you have Hamiltonian formalisms, you need potentials. Only in Newtonian classical mechanics, it was electric and magnetic fields which played a crucial role because they were entering into the Lorentz force equation, right? Q times electric field plus 1 over C, V cross B was the Lorentz force, the right-hand side of the Newton's equation. But even in classical mechanics, if you go to Lagrangian or Hamiltonian formulation, you need the potentials. But you know the problems with the potentials. They are not unique. They are redundant. There is a sort of called gauge freedom. You can find infinitely many potentials which all yield the same E and B. Therefore, as far as the classical physics is concerned, they are all the same. However, in the Hamiltonian case, for the Hamiltonian, whether it's classical or quantum, it is the phi and A are entering. How, what is the easy way of introducing it? A correct way of introducing it is using basic principles and go to the action and in, in using the symmetry and basic principles, then you introduce the electric and magnetic fields and interactions and their kinetic energies and then deduce equations of motions. But in quantum mechanics, it's the equations of motions. In classical field theory, it is the Lagrangian or actions. In quantum mechanics, it's the equations of motions. Therefore, we have a prescription of introducing electromagnetic fields, or for that matter, any gauge fields, through the so-called Pauli's minimal substitution principle. That is, P mu is replaced by P mu minus E over C a mu, that's Pauli's recipe of going from a free Hamiltonian to an interacting Hamiltonian by replacing the P's with the, the new P's as such. Okay, so if you do that, obviously you have the components, right? First of all, the space and the uh, zero components. Let me work it out ex explicitly. P0, P0 minus E over C, A0. What is the P0? P0 is the energy divided by C for dimensional reasons. Therefore, this goes to energy, goes to energy minus E phi. A0 is phi there, right? So that's the transformation of the energy. If it is the energy operator, it's IH bar D by DT, Hamiltonian. So what about the space part? Space part is P goes to P minus E over C A. Well, that's it. That's, that's essentially ready to use. So this is the one which is going to replace the P vector appearing in here. And this one is going to play a role in the left-hand side of the full Dirac equation because the I H bar D by DT is in the left-hand side. So that portion will be, if you go to the operator language, IH bar d by dt is IH bar d by dt minus E phi. 
in operator language, that's what I'm talking about for the energy. So you leave the IH bar d by dt as it is, and there is this additional piece, you move it to the right hand side, so Hamiltonian indeed becomes C alpha P minus E over C A plus MC squared beta plus E phi. So the new pieces are this and that. So it is the new Hamiltonian which is composed of the free Hamiltonian that is this term and that term and there are two additional terms we will discuss those in detail. Let's give a break at this point. It's a good point to stop.